All right, I got bad news and good news. Which one do you want first? Bad news, great. How'd you say that with a smile? Bad news. Bad news. This theme is about families, and guess what? Every single family is messed up. <laughs> good news, though. God is in the habit of using messed up families. The first family listened to another voice other than God's, then blamed each other, had a kid who murdered the other kid. Then a few generations later, you find Abraham, right? Abraham, God's chosen one, marries two women, eventually kicks one of the women and their child out of their house, has a son who has a son who marries multiple women too, just like his grandpa, and then deceives his father, steals a blessing, See, God is in the habit of using really messed up families for his glory. In fact, your messed up family doesn't thwart God's plan at all. I'm gonna deal with a not hot topic. I wanted to deal with the really fun one, like dating. <laughs> I even had a good quote from Andy Stanley, which was this, you'll like it, you'll like it. <clears throat> Are you becoming the person the person you're searching for is searching for? Isn't that good? But that's not what I'm going to share, even though I just did. <laughs> I'm going to talk about your relationship with your parents. Not a hot topic, is it? In fact, I did a lot of research to find out how often people talk about it. Turns out, never. Why, because immediately I say parents and a lot of emotion arises, doesn't it? In fact, it matters because next to your relationship with God, did you know that it's your relationship with your parents that has had and will have the greatest impact on your life? So it matters that we go to God's word and figure out the wisdom he offers to us on how to interact with our parents. And by the way, it's not just wisdom, it's a command. Ephesians chapter six says this, children, obey your parents. Now you might know you're actually not a child, but guess what? You're always gonna be someone's child, so he goes on. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on earth. Will you pray with me, Heavenly Father? Oh, I even love the start of that prayer. Our perfect Heavenly Father, we're gonna need your power to have the courage to make a phone call today. See, even now, <laughs> it's not popular but God, it's what, it's what brings about good life. So Holy Spirit, come upon us, reveal to us your truth, so we may respond with grace. We love you, and all God's children said, amen. Did you say it or, it's fine, okay. So I went to Africa a couple months ago with a guy named Bob Goff. This guy is radical. If you've ever heard him, he does these crazy messages where he's like, love people, and then I'm like, okay, so what else? And he's like, good, love people. And I'm like, yeah, but what else? He's like, everybody. I'm like, I get it. And he's like, always. And one day I'm like, how do you do it? And then he goes, come with Africa, come with me to Africa and we'll see. I'm like, okay, so we did. And here's the profound thing about this guy. He lives his message and his message is love people. Why? Because Jesus did. Very simple. Walking around Uganda with this guy was radical. Here's why. He would walk, watch how profound this is. <laughs> he would walk into rooms and then watch this. See the needs and then do something about it. That's it. And we went and we visited a bunch, of t a bunch of the things that he had already done. So for instance, he finds out about uh, witch doctors. Witch doctors. And he's like, okay, so um, what do they need? What do they need other than to stop doing the horrendous things they're doing? Well, they need education to know there's another way, so let's build a school. <laughs> okay, so he does. 
He walks into rooms. He walked into one room and there was, you know, this whole history of child soldiers or whatever had gone on in that country. And he goes, they just need education, so he builds a school. He finds out young girls are having ha- uh, terrible futures in front of them because men take advantage of them. And he goes, they need a safe home. So he goes to the local store and he just starts buying beds. And then he buys a place and then he puts the beds in the place and now it's safe. That's how this guy lives. And I remember walking around being like, is it really just that simple? He goes, yes, imagine how simple. You walk into your classroom and rather than waiting to have your needs fulfilled, you walk in and you see the needs and you do something about it. Why? Because that's all that Jesus did. It's actually that simple. And then I remember we went to visit one of the schools that he had built a long time prior. And he goes, they need more books. So they got all these crazy donations and then they were gonna have this grand opening of the library while we were there and we're like, this is so good. And I'm talking to Maria, his wife, and we're like, this is gonna be so fun. We're just gonna give away all these books. And she's like, and they'll bring them back. We're like, oh yeah, library. And then, and she goes, you know, it's so funny. We wanted to do something amazing for the grand opening. She goes, so I, you know, I got on my laptop and I started like Googling different, I'm like, weird typing, Maria. She's like, I know, it's weird. So. She goes, I got on the computer and I was like, what else could we do? What more could we do? What other needs do they have? And she found this website called Eyes for Africa and she's like, of course that exists because someone saw that these kids, in order to read a book, some of them needed glasses. So she goes, she she writes them an email and says, "Can can you just come alongside this great need that we have in our school? And this person's like, sure. And they box over 400 pairs of glasses because there's 400 kids in the school. I got to be a part of the group that opened the box. And I remember Bob looked over and he's like, let's just go give these away to all the kids. I'm like, yeah. He's like, in 15 minutes, I'm like, what? I'm like, what's the plan? He's like, love people. I'm like, okay. So I remember we got, I remember we like organized all the glasses. I don't have glasses, but apparently there's numbers on them or something. Okay, so we're putting them in order on the numbers, plus one, plus 17. So we're, you know, we're getting them all in order and some lady's like, I wear glasses. I'm like, great, you, you figure out the number with the E picture RT74 thing. Okay, and then you send them to us and we'll give them the glasses. And she's like, sounds good. So some girl just figured out the number. I remember the first kid walked over and he handed me a ticket. It said plus one, so I'm like, here you go. And this kid, it was so profound, took a pair, put it on, and we handed him a book and he did this. And all of us are like, it worked. <laughs> And then I'm like, okay, so here's, it gets even better. Choose a style. Here's the weird thing. They didn't have that word translated. It's how interesting, style wasn't a priority. You know what I mean? So I'm like, I'm like, you know, like a, like a style. <laughs> like, 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 I don't know why when I'm thinking of style, the first thing that comes to mind is this. I'm like, okay, okay, uh, here's what I need. Uh, Jojo, Jojo, come over here with us. So I'm like, here, here, uh, so this guy will just hold this mirror right here, and here's what we're gonna do. So we're, we're gonna give you a couple pairs, a little closer, a couple pairs of glasses, and you try them on, and then let us know which style works. And so, you know, they're doing different styles, and they're trying it on, and we're like, this is so good. Kid number two walks up, you're the mirror. Okay, and so kid number two takes the glasses. And we're all like, I know. <laughs> We're like, go to the mirror, go to the mirror. Mind you, okay, so all the kids now are huddled around the mirror, huddled around the mirror, and we're all, you know, handing out the glasses, and it's just this surreal moment of meeting needs, right? But here's what got weird. The mirror section started to get crowded. <laughs> I mean, I literally watched kids like, they were like this. The flow stopped working the minute we brought in the mirror. (laughs) It was working just fine until we brought in the mirror. Let me borrow this real fast. Thanks, Jojo. See, what we realized in Africa that day is in that moment, these kids did not need A mirror, because what does a mirror do? A mirror merely makes you aware of yourself, doesn't it? And it doesn't it slow you down? 
No wonder we're not seeing things clearly and meeting the needs of other people because we walk into rooms merely consumed with our needs. Do you wanna know why that passage strikes you in a hard way? Honor your parents because what it's asking is to set down the mirror for just a moment of how they have affected you for just a moment and put on a lens of Christ and come alongside them. And that is not just a lifestyle for how to interact in your families, that's a lifestyle on how to look like Christ. But let me do this before I move on. I recognize some of you have dishonorable parents, but I know there's not an exception or footnote to the great commandments. So what do we do? I'm gonna encourage you for this chapel to take the mirror and set it down. Now, it matters for you to see the effect they have had on your life without a doubt. In fact, Biola has one of the best counseling departments. Don't miss the gift of this place. There needs to be a place where you look in the mirror and see how has it had an effect, because it has. But for this chapel talk, we're gonna do something radically different and counterintuitive and nothing that you will see anywhere else in culture or the world. We're gonna put on the lens of Christ and go, how can I come alongside my parents for the glory of Jesus? God, give me clarity. So if you're up for it, I think he might even have a plan for your broken family and it might just be you. But the mirror does matter. See, the book of Ephesians is broken into two sections. I'm sure you heard this. Chapters one, two, and three talk about who you are. Four, five, and six, live like it. I'll do it again. Who you are, now live like it. Here, I'll put it this way. It spends three chapters going, this is true about you, this is true about you, this is true about you. You are already loved, forgiven, blameless, um, holy, you are all of that. Now, act like it. And then it aligns with some of the commands. And you have to understand the context of the entire passage. Here's why. Because it always has to start with who you are before you get to how to live. And remember, Ephesians chapter six is on the second half, chapter six. And this matters because otherwise our temptation will be to flip them and identify who we are based on what we do instead of who Christ was. Do you see that? So it says in Ephesians one, two, and three, in Christ you are blameless, how? Look at your past. How does that make sense? I'll tell you how it makes sense. The wages of your sin, you know this, is death. Therefore, death was the one thing that you had to pay, the consequence for your sin. Jesus died on the cross, took your sin, right? But guess what? Jesus, fully God, fully man, lived this life perfectly. And something I didn't get till my late 20s, and I, gosh, I wish you could get this. Would you just receive this for a second? Yes, Jesus died on the cross for your sins. In his resurrection, he came back to life and offered you the gift of not just taking what you deserved, but offering you what he deserved. That's why Paul in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 says, in Christ, not in and of yourself, look at your past, in Christ, you are blameless. In Christ, you are chosen, holy, and accepted. And why does that matter? Because then you won't be running to your parents to find those things. <gasps> but when you start there and receive them from above, you are already accepted, you are already loved, you are already chosen. Chosen? By the way, quick note. Although there are accidental parents, there are never accidental children. Even though your parents may not have planned you, I promise you this, God did. But when you receive from your heavenly Father the truth about who you are, then you have the freedom to set down the mirror and to walk into holiday, put on the eyes of Christ and meet the needs. And guess what? Your parents have the same needs you do. They just need a little grace. They just need to know their value. 
and they just need to be eventually taken care of. Three points. So how do we honor our parents? Number one, we start just like Ephesians chapters one, two, and three in the same way. In order for us to act like Christ, we need to be reminded of who we are in Christ. Point number one, how do you honor your parents? You remind them of their value. I know they weren't perfect, but start with an okay stuff. They may have been a horrible Christian, but give them a phone call and say, thank you for being a Christian. Do you know what I mean? Start somewhere, remind them of their value. I know it sounds crazy, I'm gonna tell you an example of how I see this lived out in my own life. My husband has an unbelievable relationship with his parents and I, praise God, have an unbelievable relationship with mine. My husband though, the number one way that he honors his father is this. When he has a question, he doesn't Google search his questions, he just calls his dad. Ladies in the room, having car troubles, <laughs> make a phone call to a parent. I know that sounds so simple, but I promise you this, it reminds any parent, gosh, I am valuable. Your parents need the same thing you need, and Ephesians chapters one, two, and three gives us a formula. Remind them of their value. Then, you get to Ephesians chapter four, and in Ephesians chapter four, it goes on to how to live like it. Remember, if they are valuable, how do you live like it? Ephesians chapter four, verse 31 says this. This is where it gets hard, ready? Get rid of all bitterness. Uh-oh. How in the world, great. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind. Here's another word, compassionate. How can we be kind and compassionate to one another? Here's how, forgive each other. Number one, remind them of their value. Number two, would you embrace forgiveness? Some of you, this sounds crazy, but I think the number one thing you need to do is forgive them. Because guess what? They need the precise thing you need, which is grace. This guy named Gary Chapman wrote this brilliant book on marriage. And he, in his book, he said this. I really liked it. Watch this. It's so good. Oh, yeah, I forgot the power. So it's there. Okay. Um, what if God's primary intent for your marriage isn't to make you happy, but holy? That's good, you know, do you know why that's good? Because it's this, it means you don't go into everything critiquing everyone and everything based on how happy they make you. You recognize that God might want to even use their brokenness to form you more into his likeness. Whew. So I partnered up with Gary, he doesn't know my name, but I changed it to this for this chapel talk. What if God's primary intent for your family isn't to make you happy, but holy? Mostly Gary Chapman, partially me. <sighs> Take a second. How do you think God is planning to come alongside you to make you look more like him by using your family? I'll ask it again. How do you think God is coming alongside you to make you look more like Christ, make you more holy, and plans to use them? Some of you need to make a phone call today. Some of you don't need to make a phone call at all. In your heart, you just need to forgive them. And then secondly, this is another big one. You may need to ask for forgiveness. And the reason I'm gonna tell you that is I've experienced it firsthand. In my biggest moment of brokenness in my entire life, my lowest moment I've ever been, I remember I knew my parents were on the other side of a door and I remember walking outside that door and knowing they were right there. So imagine, imagine your parents knowing the worst thing you ever did it happened to me. And I walked outside the door and I put my eyes up and this was my mom. My friends, 
I looked and I'm like, will you forgive me? And she's like, come here. Come here. And by the way, do you see the power of this posture? Do you see it? Do you see the power of this posture? Some of you need to not just know you're forgiven, you need to walk into it. You need to embrace it, because that particular day I did. And I remember grabbing her and going, gosh, I don't deserve a hug. Gosh, I don't deserve it. And then my dad leaned in with this simple phrase. Hey, Meg, there's nothing you could do that would make us love you any less. Why is it worth it to maybe ask for forgiveness as living proof it was the taste of grace that I needed? And by the way, just a side note, my consequence for that terrible mistake from my university called Westmont, it's fine, (laughs) was this. I had to go speak publicly about my bad choices to all the local high school students. My friends, I am a speaker because I found out I could speak because of my biggest failure. I speak for a living and I only found out when I took my greatest weakness to discover my greatest strength, put it into his hands, experienced grace, and you wanna know how God did it? Through my parents. Number one, remind them of their value. Number two, embrace forgiveness. Not sure which direction you need to go, but I invite you to go there with them. And lastly, number three, take care of them. I know that sounds crazy and you might even think that's for later on in life. Well, in John chapter nine, verses 19, sorry, John chapter nine, verses 19, verses 26 and 27, it says this, while Jesus hung on the cross. See, this Easter, my church went over the seven sayings that Jesus said from the cross and the passage they gave me was this one, John 19, 26 and 27, that says this, when Jesus saw his mother there, This is speaking from the cross. When he saw his mom and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is now your mother. And I wrote this. (laughs) Jesus had a mom. And as a mom to a toddler, I know what it's like to have a kid. In fact, uh, her kid was different though. See, she never had to discipline, she never had to course correct, timeouts weren't a thing. Her son, unlike my little toddler, was perfect. (laughs) Remember Mary's Magnificat? Her song upon realizing she would get to deliver God's only son. Her spirit rejoiced, she glorified the Lord. Her opportunity to become a mom had begun. Jesus was quite the kid, I'm sure. He always did what was right. Beyond right, he started performing miracles, healing blind people and giving sight. Yet why? Didn't he put up a fight? I'm sure his mom wondered at the foot of her son's cross. You see, Mary, I'm sure as a mom I can speak probably had quite a wide range of emotions, anger, hate, sitting at the foot of her boy's cross. I bet she was a wreck. Her boy was being unjustly sentenced to death despite being perfect. I bet she wondered if there was any other way or why a cross her son would have to bear. And then on that cross, we read in John 19, in the midst of his crucifixion, he saw his mama there. He saw her. Before he died for her, he just saw her right where she was at. And I'm confident of this, he sees you too. You see, as if that's not enough, he did my point number three, he took care of her. How? Not just because on the cross he would provide her eternal gain, but also in the meantime, he considered her present pain. 
As a son of his age, he would be required to care for his mom, so he looked to his friend John. Jesus, who would become our substitute, needed a substitute to care for his mom. Oh, what a savior, oh, what had to be done. But first to his mom, woman, here is your son. Next to his friend, whom he loved like a brother. Hey, buddy, focus outward. I need you to care for my mother. Amidst Jesus' pain, he didn't forget theirs. And I'm confident that he sees your pain too. I know Jesus has much bigger things to do, but my friends at Biola this morning, would you never ever forget that on the cross, he considered you. (laughs) See, Jesus was our perfect example, yes, of how to live, but also how to be a son. And the good news for us is, number one, because he recognized your value. Number two, he embraced forgiveness on your behalf so that, number three, he could take care of you for all of eternity. Let's look just like our Savior today. Make some phone calls and honor our parents. How? Look just like Jesus. Remind them of their value. Number two, embrace forgiveness. Why? So that number three, they too would be taken care of and God could be glorified as we look like him. I don't know how God is calling you to respond, but would you? God is in the habit of using really messed up families for his glory. Welcome to being a part of his plan. Biola University prepares Christians to think biblically about everything from science to business to education and the arts. Learn more at biola.edu.